We're in this series called Home for Christmas. It's actually pretty funny because I picked this series title a couple weeks ago, and then uh, many of my friends search to look around. It seems like they're always, everyone's doing either home for Christmas, home for the holidays, home for something because we're all home all the time, amen? <laughs> so it's like, I think we're all at the same idea. There's no place like home. Uh, if you know me, I've talked about how our journey of like no pets at all, not that we're anti-animal, but it's a lot of work, and then my kids really wanted a pet, so a year ago, we got a cat. How many of you are cat lovers? Raise your hands versus dogs. Anyone in the room? I'm the only one. Awesome. Maybe online. I bet there's some cat lovers at home. I bet there's multiple cat lovers at home. Let me know in the comments if you're a cat lover. All the dog lovers, raise your hands. There you go. Wow. A lot more. Those who say, no pets ever, raise your hand. Yeah, okay, that's, that's definitely outnumbers the cat lovers. This is my cat, James. Uh, I've talked about James a little bit. Um, he loves this window seat that we've got to sleep. I've got another picture of my daughter holding up James. You can see how long he's. There's James. Isn't that a great picture? <laughs> uh, we actually had a texting trail with, our, with my in-laws, and uh, we have a bunch of cat lovers uh, in our family, and so everyone had pictures like this, like showing their cat. It was pretty funny because my sister-in-law's cat it was like this wide. <laughs> and then uh, my other sister-in-law has a golden retriever. So she was able to hold up the whole golden retriever, which was amazing. But James, he, he, he loves to explore. And so I never thought I'd own an outdoor cat. But he whines so much, we finally just let him go and explore each evening. And so oftentimes he'll leave about 5 p.m. in the afternoon, and then he'll come home about 7 a.m. So he's actually gone more than he's home, then he races inside and he eats. I don't know what he's doing now, because I feel like everything he might be hunting, maybe he's hibernating. I don't know. Every once in a while, he still will leave us a uh, carcass on the front porch uh, as a way of saying that he loves us. But as much as James loves exploring, and, and he ranges far and wide, if you know where we live, someone called me who found him at Kerber Park, and he, hey, can you come pick him up? I was like, ah, he's fine, but I had to go pick him up over at Kerber Park, because he just likes to go far and wide. One time, a couple weeks ago, when we were still walking to school, James actually walked next to Kristen, the kids, all the way to school and back. He's a crazy cat, like he's part dog, I think. Uh, but even James, go back to that last picture, before that one, James always wants to go home, because that's where he feels safe, secure, where he can sleep, and he can get fed and rested. All of us have that longing for home, whether you're a cat lover or not, whether you're James the cat or not, we all have that longing to come home eventually. And maybe right now, home is not a great situation. Maybe it's tough, but there's still that longing in all of us to come home. And that is because we have a creator. And that creator created us to have a relationship with God. And uh, the, the way that John Calvin said it, or no, sorry, Augustine said it, was our hearts are restless until we find our home in you. That, that we never are going to feel that, that sense of rest and belonging until we find our sense of rest in God, our creator. There's this longing to come home and and feel that acceptance. And and see, the foundation of the Christmas story is that for God so loved, for God so loved the world, that he sent his one and only son during Christmas so that all who believe in him will be saved. And the invitation that God extends to each and every one of us whether we're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, man, woman, no matter our background, no matter what's been done to us, no matter the things that we've done, God invites us to come home, to be with him. That is the message of Christmas, and I think that is so beautiful. But if you, again, are struggling with, with, with not feeling like you have a home, we want you to know this, this is a place, Mosaic is a place where online, in person, we can say, hey, Welcome home. This is a place where we, we, we want you to know others and to be known. Well, as we head into the Christmas season, this is a season that l- the liturgical church calls Advent, which kind of means waiting, it's anticipation. Uh, he, he kind of in the more evangelical Baptist Pentecostal tradition that some of us are from, we just kind of celebrate Christmas. But I think if, if we don't really hone in on that Advent, we kind of miss out. 
We can get lost in just the Christmas shopping and the movies and the Christmas songs. And hey, I love all that. Like we have Christmas music going as much as we can. And I put a bunch of lights because we live on the corner of our neighborhood and I want people to, to have some Christmas cheer when they're driving in. And, and all that's good. But I said last week, as Christians, we don't celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Jesus. Christmas is the name of our celebration. And this is the season of Advent where we are waiting. We talked last week just how God created us to be in a relationship with him, but then sin comes in the world and, and wrecks it. There's this image of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Eve, created by a sister at Our Lady of the Mississippi Abbey in Dubuque, Iowa. I don't, maybe you've seen this picture online. They say like a picture speaks a thousand words, and, and this one to me, man, just resonates with me. Here you have the mother, Mary, with the Savior of the world, Jesus. And here's Eve, and she's sad because she messed up and she knows that and she ate of the fruit she wasn't supposed to. And there's the serpent, and, and I love that the seed is crushing the serpent. And there's a poem that actually goes with this. It says, Oh Eve, this is Mary talking, My mother, my daughter, life-giving Eve, do not be ashamed, do not grieve, the former things have passed away. Our God has brought us to a new day. See, I am with child, through whom all will be reconciled. O Eve, my sister, my friend, we will rejoice together forever, life without end. I think it's so beautiful. See, God's people, from the time of Eve forward, were waiting for this promised Messiah. And and. Mary is the one that God chose out of all the women in the world to carry. Mary is the most significant, important woman in the history of the world. But her story actually begins with that first woman, Eve. God created Adam and Eve in his image and likeness and bestowed on them dignity, value, and worth. That's what I love about the creation story. Is that Eve was created from the rib, from his side. Not from his head to lord over the man. Not from his foot so that he would trod on her. But they were equals together. And they were created in the image and likeness of God. And what that means is that every human is, has value, dignity, and worth. And God entrusted them the stewardship and oversight of all creation. And God gave them great freedom to, to work, to play, to, to have fun. Just one rule, one boundary. Because all, we always have some kind of boundaries. Hey, don't eat from that one tree, from the knowledge of good and evil. Just one boundary. But sadly, our our first parents, Adam and Eve, they thought, you know what? I think God is holding out on me. I think I know what's better for my life than what God says. And so they took from the fruit and they ate. And they disobeyed and sinned against God. But rather than God leaving them in their death and in their sin, headed for hell, God came to them in Genesis 3. And I love the question he asks. He says, Adam, Eve, where are you? Do you think God didn't know actually where they were? Like, were they hiding so good that he actually couldn't see them? I, I, where are you guys? I think it's a question of self-reflection. I think maybe it's a question God wants to ask you today. Kim, where are you? Troy, where are you? Ethan, where are you? How are you doing? And God comes to them. He pursues them in the same way that God comes to us and pursues us. And then in Genesis 3.15, we get what theologians call the the proto-evangelium, which is the first gospel message. We're going to see that hope is promised to us. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring, this is speaking to Eve, the the serpent, and hers. And he, the seed, the, the offspring, will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. There is promised to be one who is coming who will be from the woman, and he will crush the head of the serpent. And though the serpent will strike his heel, though he will be wounded, the serpent will be destroyed. So what is the answer to human sin, rebellion, separation from God? Well, a son will come from the line of this woman Eve. There's going to be a battle between the son and the serpent. And this son, our Savior Jesus, will be wounded, but Satan, the serpent, will be crushed and defeated. 
And so from that point of Genesis on, God's people were eagerly awaiting the birth of this particular son and, and this promised hope. And people were wondering, when is the son going to be born, the one who's going to conquer Satan, sin, and death, who's going to be our savior, our forgiver, our deliverer. And they're waiting, they're hoping in eager anticipation for thousands and thousands of years and then 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah prophesied this, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah writes this, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name God with us, Emmanuel. We talked about that last week. What does that mean that Jesus is God, that Jesus is with us, that God with us? So there's this eager anticipation. Then even after that, for 700 years, and that leads us to our text for today in, in Luke chapter 1. And a couple years ago, we spent some time going through the whole book of Luke, kind of chapter through chapter. That was a really fun journey. But I'm going to kind of give a quick overview again. Dr. Luke is the author of, of the Gospel of Luke that bears his name, as well as the sequel, the book of Acts. And he was commissioned by this wealthy benefactor named Theophilus. And Theophilus said, hey, Dr. Luke, would you go and carefully interview and investigate all these claims that I've heard about Jesus? And so gave him a lot of money in, in modern day terms, um, probably maybe $100,000, what it would have taken. That's about the average cost of, of some of Paul's missionary journeys. So probably that's what it would have cost Luke or so. And so Luke spent time months and months, and maybe a year or two, and he'd go in and he'd meet with everyone who, who knew Jesus, who saw Jesus, and, and he, like, like a good investigative reporter, he wrote it all down, then he finally compiled his amazing gospel, which means good news, the biography of Jesus. And so when you read this about Mary, you really need to think, Dr. Luke is finding Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she's no longer, you know, little Mary full of grace, teenage girl, pregnant, She's now probably in her 70s. She's maybe Grandmother Mary. And Luke is sitting down with Grandmother Mary, maybe in front of the fire. And he's like, tell me, tell me all about this. And, he's, and as a good doctor, he's saying, you know, is there anyone that can confirm your story? Can, can I talk to your, your doctor? Are there any family or friends or any evidence to support this claim? It's like, what do you mean you, you saw an angel and he's doing all this investigative work and he's fact-checking? sitting down with Grandma Mary and writing all this down. And then he writes down what we read here today, 2,000 years later. Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Last week we talked about Joseph and kind of his story. And today we're going to focus a little bit more on Mary. Well, Nazareth, Nazareth is a small town of no more than maybe 100 people, small rural town. It's between two cities, so kind of this place that people just kind of pass through. How many of you have ever been on a road trip? Ever? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you, you know, stopped in one of those little, you know, podunk hick towns where all they have is like a gas station, maybe a Hardee's or something, and, you know, you get, get gas, maybe a Slurpee or a hot dog, and you're just like, praise God I don't live here. How many of you had that experience? Yeah. Yeah. That's Nazareth, okay? It's like, it's just one of those towns you, you pass through. Like, all, all they have is, you know, a Slurpee machine, you know, maybe some uh, quick trip pizza, hot dogs. That's about as good as it gets. Small town, maybe 50, 100, maybe at the most 200 people. And so, really, for Mary and Joseph, not a lot of marrying options, right? Like, they, there's not a lot of eligible people in a, in a village that size. And so they likely, Mary and Joseph, grew up together. Maybe Joseph has a little crush on her. He's working hard at his carpentry job, trying to save up enough money to, to marry this girl. And that's Joseph. We talked about him last week. Let's, let's focus a little bit on Mary. Now, depending on your kind of church or religious tradition, that can make you feel different ways. You know, uh, some of you get a little squeamish when you start talking about Mary uh, because maybe you come from a Catholic tradition and maybe you lift up Mary too highly. Or maybe like me, you come from more of an evangelical background and we didn't want to be like the Catholics and, and lift Mary up too high, so we didn't know what to do with Mary. So really, most of the time, we just didn't even talk about Mary whatsoever. We're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but the problem is, in our culture, that 
a lot of times we revere Mary too much and put her up on this pedestal so much that she's not even real anymore. Uh, I just kind of did a quick Google search of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Go ahead and put that picture up here. This is kind of just the average kind of picture. It's like this is Mary and the baby Jesus, and they got these halos and wheat or leaves around them. You know, it's like this is what we see in stained glass windows, a lot of pictures of Mary. But if Mary was here today, a young Jewish girl, she'd be like, I have no idea who that person is. Like, who is that? And so we need to get this picture out of our heads because that's, that's art kind of honoring her, but it's not an accurate picture of who she really is. Instead, you need to think little peasant girl, peasant dress, you know, pulling water from a well, collecting firewood for her parents' house. Think of her because she was a girl in that age, being illiterate, having dirty feet, sandals, walking around in dirt facts, on dirt roads. And here's the thing, you see that picture and you think, you know, Mary's probably in her 30s. Most likely she's 12, 13, or 14 years old. Girls could be betrothed at 12 and then they'd be married at 13. All the theologians I've read think that she's either 12, 13, 14 years of age. Now just let that sink in for a little bit. Maybe some of you have teenagers. Uh, maybe some of you are teenagers. Maybe you once upon a time you were a teenager. And you think now it's like, you know, 12, 13-year-old girls, a lot of times, like, we don't even trust them with an iPhone, or let alone with a car to drive. It's like, that's way too big responsibility, right? But Jesus is going to take that junior high girl and not give her an iPhone or a car. He's actually going to give her the Savior of the world, his only son. And what an amazing picture of our God beyond all majesty. And he chooses to humble himself to put himself in the womb of Mary and to say, Mary, I'm going to need you to take care of me for the next couple of years. I won't be able to feed myself. I'm going to rely on you for all my sustenance. I mean, some of you have been nursing moms and just think, God put himself in that position to be that helpless, that needy, to identify with us. That's what Jesus did. Not some God who stands far off, but put himself in a position where he said, you know, for these years, I'm going to need you, Mary. Luke 1, verse 28. And he came to her and said, the angel, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Can you imagine? You're a junior high girl, illiterate. You've gone to synagogue and you've heard about angels, but you've never seen an angel in your life. And all of a sudden, this angel shows up and says, greetings, O favored one. She's like, who are you talking to? Like, me? And he says, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. What do you mean, O favored one? And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Gabriel, the angel, talking to this illiterate junior high girl living in some podunk town and says, God has looked over all the earth and he's favored you Mary, do you remember going to synagogue and, you know, reading the scroll from Isaiah that one would come born of a virgin? Mary, you are that virgin. You are that young girl. Verse 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, or Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, that he will save you from your sins. And the angel saying to Mary, Mary, your son is going to be your savior. Can you imagine that? Your son is going to be your savior. The angel goes on, Gabriel, he will be great and will be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. This is some huge news Gabe, the angel, shows up to this junior high girl and tells her she's going to carry God's only son. How does she respond? How she responds is is very important. She says, verse 34, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? I love, she doesn't doubt this is going to happen. But she just wants to know how. How? So there's a big difference between having some questions and having doubt, having unbelief. There's a dif- big difference between unbelief and having questions. There's a big difference between saying, you know, I, I don't believe at all. None of this could, could have happened. I don't believe that God loves me. 
I don't believe that there is some creator of the universe. I don't believe that Jesus came. You know, I, I've looked carefully at all the evidence of historical accuracy, and, and you know what? I just don't think it, it really happened. Versus saying, you know what? I believe that God loves me, and he sent his son Jesus, but I got some questions about the Bible and how it was put together. I've got some questions about Genesis 1, the seven-day creation. I don't know if, what I think about that, and, and how does this all work, or can a whale really swallow a person? Can someone really walk on water? That's okay. It's okay to have some questions, to, to wonder about the how. Christianity is big enough for your questions. You can still trust and have those questions. I love she doesn't argue with God. She doesn't disagree. She says, I believe this can happen, but how is it going to work? It's like, you know, uh, she's like, I, I didn't go to high school or college, but I do know that, you know, junior high virgin girls don't tend to have a lot of kids. So how is this going to work? Verse 35. And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. And then here's what I love, Mary's response. This is legendary. This is amazing. Go to that next verse. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Some of your translations maybe say, I'm the Lord's handmaiden. It's kind of the lowliest of servants. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Here's this simple woman from a simple small town with a simple faith, but it's a sincere faith. She knows very, liter- very little. She's most likely illiterate, hasn't been formally educated because girls are only educated up until young age. She doesn't have the New Testament that hadn't been written yet. She only has bits and pieces of the Old Testament. Maybe she treasures in her heart when she goes to synagogue with the other Jewish believers. But what she has is faith. She believes what God says. See, most of us, we have way more information than what Mary had. But far less faith. I think one of our biggest issues facing the church today is that so many of us are educated beyond our level of obedience. Some of you think, well, I, need to, I actually need to learn more. i, I got to just study and learn and grow. And that's maybe right and good, but first just believe what you've already been taught. First obey what you already know. Mary knows very little, but she trusts all. She takes God at his word and she says, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm the Lord's handmaiden. Whatever he wants, I will serve as he calls and friends, this is so amazing because I think so many of us, what we do is we, we chart out a life for ourselves. You know, this is what I'm going to get married and this is how many kids I'm going to have. And this is what I'm going to name them and this is where I'm going to live. And then we say, this is my life plan. God, will you come bless us? But instead, you know, Mary, she had her whole, whole life plan. But God came in and he rewrote her script. And if that happens to us, a lot of times we're not very happy about that. I mean, think about Mary, this young, you know, teenage girl, and she's thinking, I'm going to marry Joseph, we're going to have this great wedding, it's going to be an awesome party, the dress, dress is going to fit perfectly, then, you know, we're going to consummate our marriage in a wedding night, and then have lots of babies, and live happily ever after in Nazareth, and God says, no, that's not the way it's going to be, it's a new script. And little does she know, what that means is, is people are going to question and wonder about the parentage of Jesus forever. If you read the Gospels, they make claims about you know, the, the Jewish leaders, they're like, well, at least we know who our dad is. Our father is Abraham. Who's your dad? And that's really a dig at Jesus saying, yeah, yeah, we think your, your mom was knocking boots with some Roman soldier, not Joseph. And, and, and she had to have that stain in her reputation. And then for two years, they have to live in Egypt in another country as exiles, as foreigners, as refugees. And then they come back, and there's questions, and and so much of her life was blown up. But in this moment, what does Mary say? She says, well, whatever the Lord wants, he gets to rewrite the script for my life. I love him. I trust him. I'm his servant, says the junior high girl. What an amazing example for us. You know, we talked last week that Joseph had every right to publicly shame her, to divorce her, to even kill her. She doesn't know how Joseph's going to respond. But the fact that she's willing to flip the script of her life, 
It means she doesn't idolize marriage. She doesn't idolize her identity. She doesn't idolize comfort or security. She's willing to open her hands and forego all of that to God, whatever you want for my life. It's instantaneous. I am the servant of the Lord. Whatever you need, God. When I think of Mary's response and the kind of person that she was, I think that's just who she was. And she modeled that servanthood for her son, Jesus. And I think of Jesus in the garden praying to his father and saying, I don't want to go to the cross, God, but you know what? Let your will be done, not mine. I think there's times Jesus sounds a lot like his mom. How amazing is that? And so we don't want to make too much of Mary. We don't want to, but we also don't want to dishonor her. We want to believe what the scriptures say about her. She loved the Lord. She wasn't a perfect woman, but she was a woman of faith. And in the most amazing moment of her humble life, she's willing to let go of her reputation, her comfort, her security, her plans, her marriage. And so Mary shouldn't be the object of our faith, but she should be an example of our faith. We should all strive to have a faith like Mary's by the grace of God and to love God, to trust God, to serve like she did. She's not the object of our faith. We don't put our faith and trust in Mary. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. What a wonderful example of faith. So what does that mean for us? Well, the big idea as we close this morning is just that what does that angel tell Mary in, in verse 37? For nothing will be impossible for God. For nothing is impossible with God. God can create the universe out of nothing. God can take an elderly woman like Elizabeth who had endured the scorn and shame her whole life. People giving her a sideways glance of why did God not bless you with a womb and year after year when she saw all the other women in the village get pregnant and and thought they were blessed by God and she wondered why and her husband Zechariah has been serving God and and what is going on and finally when she's given up all hope of ever having a baby, God blesses her. If God can open and take a virgin like Mary and give her his son, if God can take on human flesh and enter history as Jesus Christ, then nothing is impossible for God. Jesus can rise from death. Jesus can raise us from death. Jesus can forgive our sins through what he did on the cross. Jesus hears our prayers. God can take enemies and make them friends, and nothing is impossible for God. And that is why we experience what Christmas carols say, the thrill of hope. That's why we sing. That is why we pray. That is why we continue to gather virtually and in person that nothing is impossible for God. In the five years in this church, I've seen couples who I was convinced they're heading to divorce and God has continued to heal and restore their marriage. I've seen a man with a warrant out for his arrest in Florida and get the charges dropped. I've seen drug addicts confess their sins and make Jesus the leader of their life, and although they stumble and fall down, now he's raising his kids. I've seen many couples struggle with infertility over the years, and then God blesses them with a baby. And why? Because nothing is impossible for God. So whatever it is you are praying for, whatever it is you are hoping for, I want you to know that nothing is impossible for God. Don't give up hope that thing you are praying for, that thing you are dreaming for, maybe it's the restoration of your marriage. Maybe it's the desire for children. Maybe it's, it's, it's a job. Maybe it's healing in your body, your mind, or your soul. Nothing is impossible for God. Kind of two quick kind of next steps for us as we close. The question I want us to ask ourselves, in what areas of my life am I limiting God by not believing him to do the impossible. My marriage, in school, with my kids, at work, with my money. What is it you've given up on? Maybe there's someone who's far from God and you're like, there's no way. I know, I I was just talking with some people this week and we were talking about someone and they said, you know what, I just think it's impossible for them to change, is what they said. Nothing is impossible for God. That person may have decades where they've fallen into this pattern of behavior. And it may seem like naturally there's no way. But through Christ, we believe that we can have a new heart and mind in, in, in him. And what's crazy is neuroscience now shows that you can rewrite the synapses 
Uh, it's called uh, neuroplasticity. And, and you can change. That you, you change your thinking, you change your behavior, and you can actually rewrite the maps of your brain. And something that the Apostle Paul wrote to us, that Jesus can renew your hearts and minds in Christ. And so what areas of your life have you been saying, you know what, I, I give up on that dream, I give up on that hope. That you need to cling to that, that nothing is impossible for God. And the second thing, uh, this week as, as I was praying and, and reading, just, just kind of meditating on, on these scriptures, something I hadn't really thought about before, was what does Mary do when the angel shows up to her and, and tells her that she's going to carry God's own son? If you read on in chapter 1, she goes to visit her relative Elizabeth. Because I'm sure in that moment, Mary's like, do I know anyone else who's been visited by an angel? And it's like, oh, Elizabeth was. Let me go talk to her. And then there's this beautiful passage, we don't have time to dive in today, where Mary composed this amazing song called the Magnificat, and just blessing God, and it's a beautiful, beautiful song. But she has to go connect with Elizabeth, because they've had this similar experience. Here's something, that if, if you have this kind of unique experience with God, or a unique experience where you feel like God has shown you something or, or given you a, a vision for the future or a hope. The reality is, sometimes it can be really hard to connect with just everyone about that. So that's why it's so important to seek out others who've had that similar experience with something miraculous, something in the divine, something out of the ordinary. And that is why, as followers of Christ... We have more in common with one another than those who you know, were born in the same town or who went to the same school or had the same hobbies. That through Christ, we are family. So again, that is why we want to help you connect with others. Because then we can share these experiences of like, you know what? Here is what God is teaching me. And and, and when I talk to my friends about hearing God, they're like, ah, I don't know what that means. Or just as I was journaling, and this is what God's been teaching me as I've been in this journey of self-discovery and self-awareness. And, and, and sometimes you have to connect with others. And then the final thing is, uh, I heard a story about a, a well-known uh, priest, father, uh, Richard Rohr, and someone said, Father, I- I'm struggling to pray. I feel like I'm praying, but I'm not hearing anything. And maybe today that's the place where you're at. And so what Richard Rohr told this person was, all I want you to do is just wake up early and watch the sun rise for a week. And she's like, that's all you want me to do? Like, no more Bible reading? Or nope, just do that. And as she put herself in a position to just experience God's creation and and the wonder of a new day, that she quieted her heart and just stopped striving and just was in a place of being, she began to reconnect with God and to hear his voice. And I think sometimes we we try so hard and and life gets busy and crazy and and we say, ah, I'm not hearing God or the Bible's not interesting to me anymore and we just kind of throw it all out. And so the last thing is just, if you're at that place in this Christmas season, and you're just like, you know, I'm not connected with God. I, I don't know. Maybe it's getting up early. Maybe you got to take a drive. <laughs> you can't see the sunrise from your house or something. And just watch the sunrise. Maybe you need to get into a quiet place where you can just be in the stillness. And don't try real hard to, to hear God, but I think in those still moments where you can just breathe, just connect with God, Open yourself up to him. Maybe you want to read just you know, one psalm and, and you're going to meditate on that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I think God is, is going to meet with you. Because I believe that all who seek him will find him. So three things. What in your life right now are you just saying, I'm, not, I'm saying this is impossible, but you need to trust that nothing is impossible for God. The second thing is maybe... There's someone you need to connect with. Maybe you've had some kind of unique experience and, and you've got to find that person who can understand on a heart-to-heart level. We all need those people. Just like 
Mary needed Elizabeth to say, hey, we've both been visited by an angel in this miraculous experience. Let's talk about this. What's going on? And, and they're sharing their stories of God and connecting. And, the, and you know, they're, they're talking fast and they're so excited. You need someone in your life like that. Someone who gets you going, who fills you with joy, who can inspire you, that you can talk about these deep things, the way that God is moving in your life. And the third thing, maybe God seems a little quiet right now, a little distant. Maybe you seem to stop striving so hard and just be. Just ask God just for that thrill of hope to that, that, the words of, you know, joy to the world, the Lord has come, that you just say, God, I, I need to feel that joy, and I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to try. I'm going to watch the sunrise or just enjoy, you know, the birds flying that are still around or whatever it might be, just to get in that quiet place and pray, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, just help me hear from you. I found journaling is really helpful. Uh, that helps me start my days out right. We talk about this, you know, kind of one of our rhythms of life is, I want to encourage you to get in the Word the first thing in the morning before you open your news apps, before you open social media. It's a great way to start your day. My hope and prayer is that this Christmas season you can know and truly believe that nothing is impossible for God. That we want to help you connect with God and with others to have those experiences, to have people in your life that you can share that heart connection like Mary and Elizabeth and just help you focus on Christ during this Advent season. Would you stand with me? may you know that God so loved the world, that he so loved you, that he gave his one and only son. And that is the message of Christmas, that it all starts and ends with love, and I want you to know that you are loved. You can just watch online. We just take a moment, maybe you just want to open your hands up and just receive that love, just to believe it, that God loves you. God is not embarrassed of you. God is not ashamed of you. God is not, you know, waiting for you to shape up and then he's going to love you more. But God loves you so much unconditionally beyond what we could fathom. That God is proud of you, that you are his son or daughter. And during these next couple weeks as we head into Christmas and celebrate Jesus, may you just feel that thrill of hope. Have a great week. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.